Welcome back to The Rate of Change with York Wealth Management. As advisors to some of the wealthiest families in the country, The Rate of Change is a podcast designed to help you in the pursuit of building long-term wealth through the insights of some of the brightest minds in asset management. I'm your host, Murdoch Gaddy, and in today's broadcast, I'm speaking with Tim Carlton, the Chief Investment Officer at OzCap Asset Management. Tim, alongside his colleagues, Will Mumford and Gavin Rogers, manage two funds underneath the OzCap banner, both of which target solid, absolute risk-adjusted returns, looking to invest in companies that generate strong cash flows and are trading at attractive prices. Firstly, the OzCap Long Short Australian Equities Fund, which has returned on average 14.5% since inception in 2012, 11% on average over five years, 12.4% average over three years, 1.5% in the past 12 months with a 58 percent return in the past month. Secondly, they have just launched the OzCap X20 Australian Equities Fund as of the beginning of December 2023. Both funds are fully invested. For me, I really enjoyed hearing Tim break down the differences and similarities between the two strategies. He discusses what exactly is an X20 Aussie Equities Fund and why they timed the launch of the fund for um, you know October, November 2023. So join us as Tim gets into the weeds on a number of companies such as Mineral Resources, Realestate.com, Car Sales, ResMed, Nick Scali, and hear his views on where he thinks markets are going as we discuss the recent movements of the 10-year bond rate for the past 12 months and its impact on current markets. Before we get into the Rockcast, I would also like to encourage you to listen to the disclaimer at the end of the Rockcast and to keep your feedback coming. You can reach me at mgatti at ywm.com.au. So with that being said, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So sit back, relax and enjoy. Tim Carlton, welcome to The Rate of Change with York Wealth Management. Good morning, Murdoch. Thanks for having me. It was really good seeing you at our Balmoral Nippers. The kids loved it when uh, the Coast Guard Santa Claus jumped off the boat. They all screamed <laughs> with glee. It was good fun, wasn't it? Yeah, it's terrific. It's, um, we've, uh, we've been proudly a uh, sponsor of uh, Balmoral Nippers for about the last five years. And, um, you know, it's just a great community initiative it's the largest um, nippers program in australia there's 850 kids that enroll in it so it's a huge endeavor and um, it's one of those uh, community initiatives that uh, the team get really excited that we support we support a number of charitable and community initiatives across the board and um, uh, the team all get a thrill out of our participation in in being able to give back to the community and to some specific causes uh, and uh, the Nippers program is probably the most visible one of those. Uh, and uh, the kids get such a kick out of that whole program. So much self-confidence. Uh, I, I have the six-year-old girls at the moment, and it was extraordinary to see how far they swim out. Um, you know, a lot of these girls are still only five, uh, and uh, they they swim out uh, to, to these boys that you look at far offshore. And, you know, a couple of years ago, they couldn't swim. So it's pretty incredible. Well, our kids certainly love it. That's for that's for sure. Um, so that's uh, that's the nipper side of things. I love getting involved in the community. So why don't we learn a little bit about Tim? Who is Tim? How did you get into finance? And uh, tell us a little bit about your formative years. Yeah, sure. So I uh, I did commerce law out of school at Sydney University, and uh, I did a n- number of internships with various investment banks uh, through that uh, program, and ended up at. Uh, Macquarie Group, as a lot of uh, graduates do uh, in their investment banking team. And pretty quickly, I ended up spending a lot of my time on uh, projects that involved Macquarie buying either the whole or a decent stake in uh, both public and private businesses. So Macquarie investing its own capital. Uh, And I'd done that for a couple of years when uh, Goldman's uh, gave me an opportunity to come across onto the public market side. Uh, and I sat within a team that was called Proprietary Strategies. And what we did was we invested Goldman's Australian balance sheet into uh, the listed equities market. 
and that was a, a reasonably small but very uh, profitable team. And I was there from uh, 2007 through to 2012. And then in 2012, uh, left to, uh, to set up OSCAP and uh, have been doing uh, that uh, ever since. So what is OSCAP? Who is OSCAP? And uh, what do you exactly do? And what's your investment philosophy? Yeah, so OSCAP is an Australian equities manager. So we uh, have clients that give us their capital and we invest that capital into a selection of Australian companies through a unit trust. So everyone's capital is pooled. We we run two different strategies. One that um, is a high conviction strategy that's been going since 2012. And then uh, just at the start of December 2023, we have launched uh, another fund, an X20 Australian Equities Fund, and its mandate is a little different. Uh, it's a very vanilla, long-only fund, uh, whereas the the fund that's been going since 2012 has a pretty wide ambit of what it can do, uh, and it only invests uh, in companies outside the 20 largest companies in the Australian market. The Australian market's a reasonably unusual market in that you have 20 very large companies um, that uh, that really dominate the, um, the the market capitalization of the whole index. So the top 20 companies make up over a little over 57 57 percent of the market capitalization of the entire index, which is reasonably extraordinary concentration. This fund is designed to invest outside of those 20 companies, so. Uh, primarily in mid-capitalisation companies, but some small companies as well. Uh, and, you know, that's the part of the market where we see the greatest opportunity for returns on a go-forward basis. Can you give a bit of colour around that? Because I remember when we caught up and um, there was a particular uh, page in the presentation which showed um, the average returns for the past number of years uh, for the top 20 the three, uh, 300 minus the top 20 and then for small caps. And I thought yes. that was quite interesting, those numbers. So do you want to give a bit of color around that? Yeah, so it's been interesting since 2000, um, the mid-capitalization companies in Australia have comfortably delivered the best total return. Uh, there's a mid-cap 50 index, which is probably a reasonable proxy for those mid-capitalization companies. And since 2000, it's delivered a return of over 800%. And that compares to um, the All Ordinaries Index, so the, the, the broader index, uh, and the ASX 20, so the 20 biggest companies. They've both delivered a little over 500%. And then the small odds, the smaller companies in the market, they've actually delivered a relatively poor return of a little over 200% in that 23 year time period. And so we think that there's a very logical basis for this. And, and the logical basis is that uh, they have delivered considerably stronger earnings growth over that time horizon than either the really large companies or the really small companies. And if you forget about all of the noise, the market gets caught up on lots of different things in the short term. And the short term can be six months, it can be 12 months, it can be a couple of years. But if you forget about all of the changes in sentiment, which stocks come into favour and out of favour, over the really long run, the only two things that, that matter are the dividend yield that you're receiving from the companies you're investing in and the earnings growth. Because if the multiple that the market's willing to pay for a company doesn't change over, total, over time, then your total return is simply dividend yield plus earnings growth. And so the mid-cap index has delivered uh, considerably better uh, returns than uh, many of the other indices for the simple reason that those companies have delivered better earnings growth and considerably better earnings growth. And we think there's a pretty logical reason for why that's the case. Uh, and we're also pretty confident that it will continue. And the reason is that at the very large end of the market, uh, a lot of these companies have run out of ways to grow organically. So if you think about the the big four Australian banks, um, they are about as dominant uh, in the domestic market as any four banks in any developed market globally. 
They're so dominant that it's very hard for them to organically grow their market share. They tend to just take market share off one another over time, uh, but they are constrained in how they can grow their top line to basically how quickly the broader market grows. On the other side of that, they've got expenses and their expenses are growing and they're growing quite strongly. So if you think about the banking sector, you've got increased compliance costs, increased spend on IT and cybersecurity, um, increased capital requirements, and now we've got an acceleration in staff costs. So you're limited as to how quickly you can grow revenues, but on but your expenses uh, often are outpacing that. So the, the banks are a good example of one of the, you know, four of the very large companies in the ASX 20 that uh, are really working quite hard just to maintain earnings. And so if you don't get any earnings growth, your total return from those stocks is the dividend yield. And that's what those four companies have exhibited over the last decade. You contrast that with the mid caps. The mid caps, they're generally pretty big businesses. So you're talking about businesses that are most often generating hundreds of millions of dollars of profit. They're typically the largest in their sector or subsector. And so they have the economies of scale. Uh, they have efficiencies compared to a lot of their peers. And yet they've still got plenty of market share room to grow. And so they're able to grow their top line um, faster than the competition because of those economies of scale. They get the benefits of the operating leverage. So you tend to find that earnings grow a little bit faster than their revenue growth. And as a result, we see a very, very attractive total return proposition in that mid cap space. You then contrast it again to the really small end of the market. And a lot of those smaller companies, they are at a natural disadvantage to a lot of the companies in the mid cap space. Not, not always, but frequently because they're smaller businesses, they don't have quite the same economies of scale. And a very obvious example of that is you compare REA to Domain. So REA is a much bigger business, substantially higher revenues. And yet, if Domain wants to keep up, they've got to spend the same sort of money on maintaining uh, their technological progress, on improving uh, you know, the experience from a user base. Uh, so it's, very, it's more difficult for them because they've got a smaller revenue base um, from which they can reinvest capital to, uh, to improve the experience. And you tend to see that in the differential between the growth rate in earnings over time. So we're quite attracted to the mid-cap space. There are also some small cap companies that I'm sure we'll talk about later. But again, they tend to be small cap companies that uh, are reasonably uh, uh, dominant from a market share perspective in their particular category, or they have some sort of uh, efficiency uh, um, uh, differential to their peers that allows them to earn superior economics. So that's the investment thesis of why you've gone that particular space. So before we get into the fun part, which is uh, you know unpacking what you, where you see opportunity, you know what you bought recently, all the all the goodies. Um, why don't we uh, quickly uh, dig into the mechanics of the fund, right? So sure. uh, how much how much money is currently in the fund in the first fund? So the current fund, the the the, the, the fund that's been around since two thousand and twelve has about three hundred million invested in it. How big's the team? So the investment team is three, and it's the same investment team uh, across both funds. So uh, alongside me is the deputy portfolio manager, William Mumford. Uh, he is a terrific um, young uh, investor. He's been with us for uh, between five and six years, uh, came out of Macquarie Group, not uh, dissimilar to myself. And uh, Gavin Rogers is an investment manager in the team. Gavin and I have worked. Uh, alongside one another for most of the last 20 years. So uh, we worked very closely together at, uh, at Goldman's and uh, he's, he's uh, rejoined me in an official work capacity uh, five or six years ago at OzCap. So it's, it's an experienced team. Uh, we uh, find we bring different perspectives to the analysis. Um, all good stock management is a collective um, proposition and uh, we like to think that we balance each other nicely. So there's been a lot of volatility in the market um, the past number of years. So how's the performance been? Does the do you, do you find um, you know when uh, during COVID when a huge amount of cash went into the market, you get a very very large 
uh, capital growth? And then does that come off as you know uh, free money gets pulled out, or do you find uh, so the portfolio is kind of got to go anywhere strategy, right? You can do resources, you can kind of move anywhere within that three hundred. Um, so how's the performance been? Has there been many drawdowns, or has it been I mean, I, consistent? I expect we're going to um, prefer an environment where interest rates are back in a normal range compared to history. Um, and so, you know, if I think about performance, Mercer came out with um, with their analysis of um, every Australian equities manager that they track. I think there are 132 Australian equities strategies um, in October. And, and we were fortunate to rank in the top five across all time horizons, and we were number one over three years, uh, 10 years and since inception, uh, and number four over one and five years. So that the fund has been performing well, but there were there have been difficult periods. Um, when interest rates started their trajectory down to zero, that was a tricky period because we are a quality and value manager. So we want to own the best businesses out there, but we are reasonably selective as to price. Uh, we want to pay fair, ba- fair value or better. Um, and we went into this strange environment where businesses that had uh, reasonable prospects for good earnings growth were suddenly trading above valuations um, that we considered to be fair. And that move just kept going um, into um, and following COVID uh, with obviously interest rates going down to close to zero. And that was challenging for most value-oriented managers. Um, we've come out the other side of that and um, you know we're very happy that despite what felt to us like a pretty difficult period, the fund performed um, uh, uh, quite strongly through those years. And now we're back in an environment where interest rates look like they're going to hover in a normal historic range. So call that you know, interest rates between 3 and 6% over time. And as a result, you've seen a derating in some of the sectors where we found it really difficult to find investments that we were, we were happy with, um, largely due to um, the valuation um, uh, differential between where they were trading and what we thought was fair value. So in the last 12 months, we've seen a lot of healthcare companies derate, a lot of IT companies derate, infrastructure and utilities companies come back from a multiple perspective. And so all of a sudden, we're seeing um, quite a lot of opportunities across the broader market uh, that we are enticed by. So, um, you know, as we sit here today, we're pretty fully invested across both funds and, uh, and quite excited about the outlook for the businesses that we hold. What does that translate um, into historical percentages with the performance, just to give, you know, people that don't have a chart in front of them just a bit of an idea? Sure. So the, the existing. And, and the, the other question on that is what, what are you targeting? Sure. So the Long Short Australian Equities Fund, which is the fund that's been around since 2012, has delivered about 15% um, net of fees per annum uh, since we started. Uh, the uh, index that we compare ourselves to, so the All Ordinaries Accumulation Index, has done a little under 9%. So the fund's delivered about 6% uh, net of outperformance per annum. And that might not sound like a lot to um, uh, those that aren't familiar with equity markets, but the compounding effect uh, of that additional return is is quite strong. So, um, uh, you know, it's probably at the top end of the band for what we hope to deliver over time. We, we always tell uh, people that are coming into the fund that we look for uh, opportunities that we think will deliver the fund a 10 to 15%. Uh, annualized return at the stock level. So if the fund overall is doing that collectively uh, and, and towards the top end of that range, then you know we're very, very happy with how that fund is performing. So you mentioned um, interest rates, right? You know, having it back in a band is, is you know, good for the fund. Um, and I was just discussing with a client, actually. We're looking at the Australian 10-year bond, uh, bond rate, and it's been quite volatile this year. Um, it was around about March, April, 3.25% came all the way up, nearly touched 5% around about November. And, you know, in line with the rally we've seen in the past few weeks, you know, it's come pulled back to about 4.145% as of today. Um, why do you think this has happened? And do you think this means uh, we're in 
for a Christmas rally. Well, I think we've started to see the Christmas rally um, already, uh, and and that has every chance of continuing if history is any guide. Interest rates at the long end of the curve, so the 10-year government bond rate, uh, typically tell you about uh, how investors are thinking um, in, in relation to where long-term interest rates will be. So if we wind back a few months where uh, the 10-year was significantly higher, it had been rallying because people's expectations were that interest rates would continue to head north uh, because the economy looked like it was handling um, current interest rates uh, quite comfortably. And uh, to be honest, to us, the Australian economy um, still looks like it's handling current interest rates relatively comfortably if the data is anything to go by. Uh, but uh, inevitably, uh, the world uh, pays a lot of attention to what US government bond rates are doing. And uh, it looks as though uh, rates in the US may have peaked. And so expectations for the future have changed from uh, a scenario where market participants thought that interest rates uh, were going up to one where uh, participants now think that interest rates may have peaked and the next move, albeit not immediate, will be for interest rates to go lower. Why does that matter? It matters because uh, what a, how a government bond trades is really perceived by a lot of investors to be equivalent to the risk-free rate. So most people think that investing in a US Treasury or Australian Treasury um, note, that is you are lending to those two respective governments, is about as close as you can get to a risk-free investment. In other words, there's a very, very low chance of default. And so every other asset class is priced off that rate. So if, if, if you can get 4% in an Australian government bond, then obviously every other asset which has higher risk than investing in the Australian government uh, should deliver a better return. So as that rate moves north, the total return that's being offered by other asset classes also needs to move north. And so if the total return... Um, that's expected from other asset classes is moving higher, then that only happens if the prices of those assets is going lower. And so as rates are rising, you tend to find that a lot of other investments um, are under pressure because they need to reprice so that they are um, uh, attractive in a relative sense compared to what is a risk-free asset. The, the, the reverse is also true, which is what we've just seen lately, and that is if uh, the rate that you can get uh, by lending to the Australian or US government is declining, then it's making a lot of other investments relatively more attractive. And so you tend to find that in that environment, a lot of asset prices will rally. And that's what we've seen, particularly over the last six or seven weeks. So um, listen, normally this time of year is uh, reasonably strong. Historically, the market's um, been very powerful from about mid-October through till the end of April. So we're in a seasonal window where for whatever reason, history has suggested that markets do quite well. If you throw into the mix um, a declining government bond rate in Australia and in the US, um, then you know, it would suggest that potentially um, the Santa rally uh, can continue for the next little while at least. Well, when we caught up, I think it must have been early November or late October, um, you said it was a very good time to launch a fund. And, uh, you know, looking back, you know, probably it was a very good time to launch a fund. Um, in that uh, good, lovely breakfast, which we had, um, you mentioned a couple of companies uh, which you thought, as you, as you mentioned before, the healthcare space. I think you mentioned uh, Mineral Resources, Car Sales, Nick Scarly, uh, ResMed. Um, Happy for you to dig into those, uh, or is there any? What other opportunities are you currently seeing in the market? As you said, you're fully invested now, but you know you said it's been a very good time to get in. Markets had a good rally. Look at the bond rate. Yeah, interested to unpack a couple of companies with you. Sure. Well, there there's some good companies to start with. So why don't we um, why don't we kick off uh, with a number of those companies? We, we spend a fair bit of time on the road, and uh, we've just been visiting uh, a number of those businesses. So not long ago. Um, one of the members of the team, Gavin, uh, came back from uh, visiting uh, Mineral Resources and, and some of their sites, uh, in particular their uh, two major mines in the lithium space, uh, Wajina and Mount Marion, and also their latest iron ore development at Onslow. 
And we're always very positively surprised by uh, this company. If I think about our core process, what we're trying to do is find businesses that we think will reliably and consistently grow earnings over time. Uh, because ultimately, we're a believer that earnings drive share prices in the long term. So we want to find businesses that are going to uh, grow their earnings in a uh, measured and consistent way over time. And to do that, they, they need to have superior economics. So superior economics means that when they invest a million dollars, they typically earn a better rate on that million dollars invested than a lot of their peers. And certainly a lot of the companies that you just mentioned are in that category. So mineral resources, it's uh, a cyclical business. It's uh, its core business um, going back to its IPO is a crushing contracting business, the largest crushing contractor for a lot of the major iron ore and other players in the market. Uh, but they have over the years um, diversified and now they also run their own iron ore operations. Uh, they're the fifth largest uh, producer of uh, lithium globally and they've got an emerging uh, gas business. And they, despite being a cyclical company, have generated an extraordinary track record in terms of growing earnings at an attractive rate over a long period. So they've compounded earnings at north of 20% per annum since they listed, which is a pretty extraordinary record. And we look at that company at the moment, and we have followed this company since close to IPO at Goldman's and then at Auscat. We look at that business today, and we think that the growth they have in front of them in the next couple of years, are putting commodity prices to one side, is about as good as we have seen for this business since it listed. Um, they are they're going to see their mining services business um, more than double in the next couple of years. They're going to see their iron ore production quadruple. They're going to see their lithium production triple. And they're probably going to emerge with what is a reasonably substantial gas business. Um, and so, yes, their earnings will be a function of the fluctuations in the commodity prices. Now, that's something that's outside of their control. But what is inside their control is how they grow and manage their business over time, and they've done an exceptional job at that. The stock has had a very decent pullback over the last 12 months, so uh, we have been adding to that exposure in the last six to eight weeks. Uh, it's a business we know very well, and we think that the market is is currently mispricing that company. Our valuation is well north of the current share price, so we, we have been adding to, to Min. Um, you mentioned ResMed. Uh, which is one stock that hasn't been in the portfolio for some time, but we have recently- when, you, when you when you dig into Resmed, I, I find this uh, quite interesting. Like you know, a colleague of mine um, was using the the Nova Nordisk uh, product, you know, the diabetes drug, and I was speaking to a couple of other people regarding this. And it when when that came out, there was this panic in the market. You know, you see it all the time. Oh, there's a new drug on the market. You know, this is gonna. Everyone's going to be healthy now. We don't need sleep apnea machines. We don't, you know, because everyone's been healthy. So you get these gigantic overreactions. Do you think that's what's happened in the healthcare space or is it another reason why they're trading at such low uh, valuations compared to where they were 12 months ago? Yeah, if, if I'm honest, I think, I think part of it is the news flow, but just as big a part is the fact that a lot of the stocks that have been expensive for the last four or five years are looking for a reason to derate. So if we wind back to pre-2018, ResMed didn't trade north of 25 times earnings. Right? And then we went into this interest rate world where interest rates were close to zero. And a lot of the healthcare companies where there was a perception that their earnings growth was independent of broader economic growth, they started to trend higher and trade at multiples that they'd never really traded at previously. So a lot of healthcare companies traded up to 40 to 50 times earnings, even very large businesses like CSL. Uh, well, that, that might be warranted um, in a, an interest rate environment where government interest rates are very, very low. Government bond rates are very, very low. But if we're back into a more normal cycle, then you would expect over time that the valuations would look more similar to how these businesses traded uh, the last time interest rates were uh, between 3 and 6%. And so if we go back and we look at ResMed between the early 2000s and about 2018, it traded on a PE of between 16 and 25 times. 
So the problem wasn't necessarily the announcement of the GLP-1 drugs. It was the fact that the starting point for ResMed was a PE of 35. And so if there's suddenly a question mark about the earnings growth that they might deliver on a go-forward basis, the question is, well, where does the value manager step in? And the value manager doesn't step in at 30 times or 25 times. The value manager steps in to accumulate a reasonable position at around 20 times. And, uh, you know, that was us as an example. So we have been accumulating a fair value position in ResMed um, over uh, September, October, November, because it was the first time that we'd thought that ResMed was at fair value or better in at least five years. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, we weren't going to step in at 25 or 30 times. So the, the, the fall looked very, very um, considerable, but we would attribute a decent um, chunk of that fall to the fact that the starting point was just too high. And I think to the extent that some stocks are still trading at very elevated multiples compared to their own history before interest rates were, um, you know, had this um, trajectory down to zero. Um, we suspect that over the next 12 to 24 months, a lot of those stocks are going to find an excuse to derate back to the sort of multiples that they traded on before we went into this, um, this sort of free money world of interest rates being at zero. And I think resume is just an example of that. So do we think that the concern over the impact of these drugs is overblown? Yes, um, for a whole variety of reasons. That's why we've been comfortable to buy into the business. But it took a reasonable derating of the business before we were happy with the valuation. So from our perspective, it's not screamingly cheap here. It's around fair value. In fact, it's had a little rally in the last couple of weeks. So it's probably a little, a little above fair value if we were being completely honest. Um, but it's certainly such a quality business uh, that we, uh, we certainly think it warrants a uh, fair value size position. I was quite surprised when you mentioned uh, Nick Scarly. Um, I've never had personally much success investing in, um, you know, furniture businesses um, besides uh, Temple and Webster, um, you know, historically. But yeah, can you walk us through Nick Scarly? Because, um, you know, I live close to Artam and walk in, you always see how their operations. But when you're breaking down the numbers and specifically the owner of the business, how he negotiated those current contracts, what do you have like? Uh, five uh, contractors which you use and he just went in there and go, no, price isn't good enough, boys. Can you do me better? Uh, can you walk us through that? And what was the other business? Is it Soft Pillow or something and the margins were huge? Um, yeah, yeah so, I, I, I've, so- I've looked into that business a lot since you mentioned it and I was quite, quite stunned at how well it works and the profit margins. In it. Yeah, from our perspective, it's a beautiful business. So, if you think about most retailers, most retailers, they go out and they purchase a whole lot of stock. So all the money goes out the door. And then they've got these um, shops, which they typically lease, and they fill them with product, and then they hope to sell the product. And for a lot of companies, that's a pretty difficult proposition because quite often they're trying to, get, to guess what's on trend, what's um, you know fashionable this particular season. And if they get it wrong, you've got to remember they've already bought the product. Uh, so they then got to discount it to get rid of the product, right? So it's a lot of cash out the door, and then you're trying to get the cash back with a return. Nick Scarly is a different model. So they're Australia's largest furniture supplier, uh, and uh, you typically pay a 50% deposit when you go and buy a couch with them. So couches is the main category um, that they sell, and they're custom made. So you walk in and you say, I want a three-and-a-half-seater, in this particular fabric, this particular design. Um, And so it's custom made for you. The the beauty of the business model is that when you sign up for that couch, you give them a 50% deposit, but their margins are such that that 50% 50 deposit has more than paid for the construction of that couch. So you've given them more money than it'll cost them to go and actually make that bit of furniture. So they then put the order in, they then um, buy it off a bunch of manufacturers, um, primarily in Vietnam and China. And then the product is delivered to you and on delivery, they'll um, charge you the other 50%. And a large part of that other 50% uh, is their profit margin. So it, it's, it's working capital is positive. They get more cash all the time coming in than they actually have going out. So they don't 
They're not trying to guess any seasonal trends uh, or what might or might not be fashionable this season. They, uh, they're they a, a very, very good retailer from a presentation perspective. So the Nick Scarley stores always look fantastic. And because they're the largest furniture buyer in Australia, their economies of scale in terms of the deals they drive with um, their suppliers, which is what you were referencing earlier, is, is clearly better than any of the other players in the market. And that leads to superior economics. A couple of years ago, they used the windfall gain that came from uh, a surge in financial furniture um, uh, demand through COVID to uh, acquire Plush. And it's, it's a slightly different um, business in that they cater for a different customer. It's more traditional, um, whereas Nick Scarley is more um, designer-led Italian um, styled furniture. Uh, but it's given them an opportunity to now expand two brands into the domestic market. The, the incredible thing about the plush acquisition is just what they've done with that business since they bought it. So they have completely reconfigured the economics of business. Um, they have uh, taken a lot of the product away from the existing suppliers and put it through their own channels. And the end result of that is today, the average price point in plush is down on where it was before they bought the business. And yet the quality is up. So that's a pretty incredible customer experience if the, if the price is down and the quality is up. And yet their margins are considerably better than uh, how the plush business was operating before they acquired it. So that is, that is an incredible trifecta. Um, they're the only business that's listed on the ASX that we're aware of. What is the profit margin of Plush? Well, it depends on how you define it. Uh, uh, but at the EBIT margin level, they're typically generating about a 15% EBIT margin um, on, uh, on their product. Uh, and they're the only business that we're aware of in the, in the Aussie market that's got a return on equity that's averaged over 50% since they listed. So they've been listed for 15 odd years and that is an extraordinary record. What does that mean? That means that when they go and set up a new shop, if the new shop costs them a million dollars, they're earning $500,000 worth of net profit after tax on that million dollars invested every year thereafter. So that is better than a lot of the really high return on equity businesses that you might otherwise think of, think REA or car sales, two very, very good businesses that we both own. Um, uh, so their metrics are, are very, very attractive. And, and from an investor's perspective, because everyone is quite fixated on um, how cyclical um, the retail market is, you often get opportunities to buy this business at high single-digit, low double-digit um, multiple of earnings, which is uh, considerably cheaper than the rest of the market, despite the fact that, again, they've compounded earnings since they listed at over 20% per annum. So. From our perspective, one of the best management teams in retail in Australia and, uh, and a very, very good business um, to own over the long term. Yeah, it's very interesting. Car sales. Um, always loved this business. Just sold a car with car sales recently. You know, got a four-wheel drive. Kids, good fun, <laughs> run around, holidays are coming. Um, but I was interested to hear about their expansion. Was it into South America? Yeah, so they've they've owned and how that state. worked. Yeah, well, I mean, again, um, uh, Will just came back from uh, visiting uh, car sales uh, or two of the three major car sales overseas operations. So he went and visited Trader Interactive in the US um, with the company, and then flew down to Brazil and uh, and spent some time with um, their Brazilian business, um, Web Motors. So. They've had a 30% stake in Web Motors for quite some time now, over, over a decade. And uh, recently, they took that ownership stake from 30% to 70%. So they, they um, switched positions with Santander, uh, the large global bank who had previously owned 70%. Uh, they now own 70%. They own 100% of Trade Interactive, which is the US business. And... The, the interesting thing about those two acquisitions, it now means that car sales or car group as they're, as they're called today, uh, have more than 50% of their revenues coming from international sources. So the Australian business is obviously incredible, very, very dominant in the domestic market, uh, but they own uh, uh, three international businesses, those two and one in um, uh, Korea, that are again, the number one players in their market and have a very, very long 
runway for prospective growth. And the exciting thing coming out of those two trips to um, North America and South America was the fact that uh, after car sales took 70% of Web Motors and 100% of Trader Interactive, they are now really inserting their intellectual property into those two businesses. And what we expect that you'll see out of that is an acceleration in revenue uh, growth in those two countries, which is significant because, as I mentioned, the international uh, the international businesses are now more than fifty percent of the group's revenue, and we should therefore see some positive operating leverage because there's quite a lot of low hanging fruit um, uh, uh, by adopting some of the practices that have been evident in the Australian business for over a decade now into both of those businesses. So some things like dynamic pricing, where you price your ads according to the value of the product you're selling. That gives you an automatic uplift on uh, how much money you're making from different categories of, um, of auto uh, in, uh, in the Brazilian business, as an example. So um, at the moment, that international business has EBITDA margins around 50%. The Australian business, their EBITDA margins around 65 And we can't see any reason why those two won't converge over time and we don't think the Australian margins will pull back. In fact, we think there's still some scope for them to improve marginally from here. So we should see pretty strong revenue growth and uh, some operating leverage dropping to the bottom line. Uh, so it's a, it's a very, very high quality business, um, very high return on capital. It always trades at a relatively expensive multiple. So we're, we're pretty picky about when we add to that position. Broadly, it's when we see big market sell-offs or sell-offs in its particular segment, uh, but uh, certainly a business that we're very, very happy to own through the cycle. Yeah, it's a very strong, interesting business. It's a good uh, customer experience as well using the platform. Um, you mentioned REA a number of times, and I s- assume that like most Australians uh, listening all own Aussie property or don't and want to get in or, you know, been renting, waiting for this crash that's meant to be happening for the past 18 months that hasn't actually occurred. So when you're looking at REA as a business, um, do they give, in your opinion, is there any insights onto what, uh, where the property market's heading or the current state of affairs in Australia? They, they tend not to give um, opinions on property prices. What's important for REA is uh, property transactions and listings. So um, they make money when people list their properties for sale. So if, if turnover is low, then you'll tend to find that listings have been low and that's, uh, that has a depressive effect on um, their business because the more listings there are, the more money that they make. Um, if house prices fell, do we expect it to negatively impact um, their business? Not particularly. The um, the amount that REA take as a percentage of the house price is still very, very small. In fact, it's very small by comparison to um, how much the real estate agent takes. And yet, if you think about the starting point for um, most people in their property journey, whether they're looking to... Um, buy a house for the first time, whether they're looking to upgrade their house, whether they're looking to downsize, whether they're looking to rent, um, whether they're looking to sell, um, all of those journeys typically start with REA and quite frequently um, domain as well. And so they are a critical um, part of that whole uh, property transaction process. And at the moment, their share of wallet, the amount that they're charging as a percentage of the total transaction costs is pretty low. So we don't think that they would need to adjust prices lower if property prices fell. In fact, they've consistently over the years raised prices and we think that there's still a very, very long runway for that to continue. But there are other exciting parts to that business. Uh, It's going to sound like Will has been everywhere lately, and that is partly true. I think he told me that he's been on four continents in the last four months um, lately, but uh, he did just come back from India as well, and REA have uh, 80% of uh, the number one portal in India, and that is a very, very exciting proposition. It's actually detracting from earnings at the moment uh, because they are investing very, very heavily to cement their number one position in what is a very, very large market. But it's a market that's got used to paying 
for uh, uh, listings within the real estate space. So uh, similar in some respects to Australia on that front. So the, the revenue growth is very, very strong at the moment. They're reinvesting more than they make um, to make sure that they extend their lead as the number one player in that segment. At some point in the next couple of years, you're going to start to see the economics of that business come through because uh, as the revenue growth accelerates, their cost growth will start to increase at a slower rate, which means that you move to becoming a profitable business and then a very, very profitable business. So we think that that um, Indian business has uh, uh, quite uh, considerable potential and considerable value at this point in time, and that's not reflected, for instance, in the in the multiples that you might look at when you look at the business um, as we stand here today. Uh, so, uh, you know, you need to separate out the value that we would ascribe to the Australian business and the value that, you just, that one might ascribe to um, the, the business in India. And, uh, you know, there was nothing within that site visit that left us anything uh, but impressed with the progress and um, drive within that business. And it is obviously an enormous market um, uh, if it's not already soon to be the most populous country in the world, um, it's a democracy, it's English speaking. So there are a lot of um, reasons that we should be um, quite excited about REA's involvement. Yeah, it's, that's really interesting. I didn't know they were expanding into India. Um, where else are you currently seeing opportunity? Um, there's a number of companies that I'm familiar with that you guys own or picked up recently. Um, surprise me. What, what, what else have you picked up or where do you see opportunity? Listen, I think there's like there's there's more opportunity in the market at the moment across sectors than we have seen for some time. So the, the real opportunity I think lies in the mid and small cap space, and it's it's a function of two things. One, there's much stronger earnings growth that you're going to see from some of the companies in the mid and small cap space than you're going to see at the very large end of town. Um, uh, and that's going to continue for the next decade and beyond, in our opinion. Um, and then on the other side of that, valuations have pulled back. In fact, valuations have pulled back considerably in the last two years in those same parts of the market. So the mid and small caps have underperformed the large caps um, for, for nearly two years now. And uh, we don't think that that's a function, by and large, of the underlying performance of the businesses. So if we think about our portfolio, our portfolio holdings are doing very, very well at the company level. And we spend a lot of time on the ground with those companies. I spent four weeks in the US only a couple of months back. Uh, and uh, that was visiting around 15 uh, Australian listed companies and their operations. Uh, the businesses that we own, we're very uh, relaxed, are performing well and growing their earnings. And so the fact that prices have gone lower just means that valuations today are more attractive than they were a couple of years ago. And so that's that's an exciting time to be investing because at the end of the day, you make your money most of the time from buying at attractive levels and then holding for long periods. And that's exactly what we do. So the portfolio that we or portfolios that we run um, tend to be invested for many, many years um, in the stocks that we hold. You can see that because we report the top 20 positions in both funds every single month. And what people might notice is that those positions don't tend to change very much over time. So we're a long-term investor in these businesses. We try to pick our point of entry. We want a valuation that's fair value or better. And uh, then we'll be, uh, we'll be invested for some time. But th there are many opportunities that we've been nibbling away at recently. And obviously, the, the X20 fund has only launched um, at the start of December 23. And so, uh, you know, we have been uh, investing uh, the funds in that um, vehicle uh, and we, we invested them reasonably quickly in, into what has been a pretty strong market. So we're certainly happy with how that fund has started. Oh, so with a new fund, um, how many stocks are currently in the portfolio and uh, your position sizing? Yeah, so there's 48 positions in the X20 fund. So it's slightly different to um, the long short Australian equities fund. The long short Australian equities fund is a high conviction fund. So it's not uncommon to find some positions that are around 10% or maybe a little above 10% if they've gone up and we still have as much conviction in them as we did when we first purchased the security. Uh, and our 
holdings are concentrated in the companies that we have the highest conviction in. So we're completely sector unaware. We might have some considerable sector exposures. In fact, at the moment, we've got a 34% exposure to the consumer space, um, which is considerably above what the, um, what the index looks like. Uh, and so it's appropriate for people that want to invest in a relatively concentrated fund that will often um, behave quite differently to the market, but is invested in what we think are the best ideas in proportion to how good we think that the opportunity is. Uh, the X20 fund is a little bit different. And um, for those uh, investors that care about performance compared to an index, we have tried to make this fund so that it is sector aware. So its sector exposures look quite similar to the X20 index. There's an ASX 300 X20 index uh, and its sector exposures um, will look pretty similar over time to those of the fund. So it'll be more a function of the stock picking within the sectors as opposed to uh, the sector allocation as to how that fund delivers performance. And it has a very particular market again. And the aim of that fund is to um, have consistency of outperformance over time. So rather than having years where it outperforms by a lot and then potentially the following year gives a little bit of that back, the aim of the X20 fund is to uh, consistently uh, deliver returns that are a bit better than um, the, um, the index and the broader market um, over, over time. So uh, we're very excited about that fund. I was a considerable co-investor in that fund from the day it launched. So I have um, considerable exposure to both funds and importantly, both um, uh, me and Will and a lot of other people for that matter, uh, their uh, sole equity exposure is uh, in, the, uh, in the two funds that we manage. So we certainly eat our own cooking. We invest in accordance with how we think um, an equities portfolio should be best managed for the long term. And, uh, you know, we're, we're considerable equity holders in the two funds. Thanks for that. The other reason I, I quite enjoy having these conversations is, um, you know, active fund managers, you know, it's all people. And, you know, how do you think? How do you make decisions? You know, you, like they say, when you're sitting at a poker table, you know, you, you read the player, not the cards, right? And um, I would love to discuss um, uh, mineral resources again, but more in lines uh, on how you invest in that position, what percentage you got up to, when did you trim it, why did you trim it? Uh, you used, I believe, lithium carbonate price as a, as a leading indicator, and then why you went back into it. And why this is important is a number of investors using funds um, you know, uh, have been informed that some fund managers are actively managing the positions internally, but some people, they hear that and they go, well, what is that, exactly does that mean? So using yes. um, resources, do you mind giving an overview and just saying the percentage, what it, what it was, where it got to, how you trimmed sure. it, and then that'd be great. So if we think about mineral resources, it, it's in the resources space. Uh, and so the number one driver in the short term of its earnings are the commodity prices um, for the commodities that it is exposed to. So we are more active around the management of uh, our commodity related exposures than a lot of other stocks in the portfolio. So if we think about any boring industrial company, we will typically just let that position sit in the fund. And the only reason why we would change um, our exposure to that position uh, typically are if the stock price gets well ahead of itself and we can't justify the current valuation, in which case we will reduce that a little bit. Uh, or if everyone gets particularly um, depressed about the 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 uh, particular business, in which case we will ordinarily look through the cycle. And if we still like the business and nothing has changed in the investment thesis, then we will be adding to that exposure. There is obviously the third scenario as well, in which um, a change in circumstance or a change in opinion in the investment team uh, uh, re results in us um, exiting a position entirely because either we've realised that we were wrong in our investment thesis or the facts have changed such that it invalidates our investment thesis. But thankfully, that last point doesn't happen too often. And most of um, the, the changes in the portfolio are at the edge with those industrial businesses. It's, it's a little bit more active than that for businesses that are exposed to commodities. And mineral resources is, is a classic example of that. So, you know, when this stock was down at 
fifteen dollars, uh, it was around a five uh, percent or a little bit north of five percent position of the fund, and uh, we thought it was um, remarkably cheap. It it then went from that sort of level up to ninety dollars, and it did it in a relatively short time horizon. And there were a lot of things going in its favour during that period, most obviously an explosion in the lithium price north. And you know it was in the fortunate position where it could capitalise on that because it had um, two significant um, ready-to-go lithium operations, one that had been in care and maintenance and one that had operated throughout that period that were two of the more significant lithium mines globally. So it benefited very strongly. And then about a year ago in, in December 2022, we saw a few things that we were concerned about. Um, one was the build-up of um, inventories within the supply chain for um, electric batteries. And a majority of the, the new lithium that is being produced today is going into EV batteries. And so as we saw this build-up in inventories, both at the battery end but also at the carbonate end at various stages along the production processing line, uh, we became a little bit concerned, and at the same time, the lithium carbonate price, which is one of the different types of lithium product, it had started to turn down and was dropping. And it has led um, uh, spodumene, which is a, which is the base product that a lot of the Australian miners produce, and lithium hydroxide, which is a lot of the um, the, the battery grade product that um, a lot of the spodumene goes into, um, consistently over the last five or six years. At the same time, there were also there was also negative news around iron ore because housing starts were dropping precipitously in China, and China is the major consumer of steel globally, and therefore the major consumer of iron ore. So its two commodity exposures were suddenly facing headwinds, and yet the stock was hitting um, new all time highs. And so, by that stage, despite select trimming along the way, uh, the position had grown to around fourteen percent in the fund. And when we saw a change in circumstances, uh, uh, we, we acted and we cut that position considerably. In fact, I think we ended up cutting it by over 70%. So it went all the way back down to between 4 and 5% in the fund. And over the last year, you've seen this excess in um, lithium inventories in the supply chain play out by way of lower prices. So the, the lithium price... Um, uh, lithium prices have dropped precipitously. In fact, many of the indices are down 80% in that last 12 months, which is extraordinary. And ha- that, that has retraced most of the upward move that we saw in uh, the year or so prior. Uh, but we're, we're currently seeing some signs that the inventory levels are normalising within the channel. We certainly think that the lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide producers are back to the sort of normal levels of supply that we expect to see them see of them um, in a typical environment about 30 days worth of supply of the base product there is still some excess supply in the battery channel but we think we'll work through that over the next three to six months and obviously the the stock prices have now pulled back considerably to reflect more conservative assumptions around the price of lithium on a go forward basis in the meantime mineral resources has been very very busy at at, at managing what they can control, so in that twelve month period they've gone and they've gone and bought off a receiver a third lithium operation at Bald Hill for what we think is an incredibly attractive price, and they have continued to progress this move to become a very very low cost producer in the iron ore space so they're going to go from a small scale iron ore producer that is high cost to a much larger scale low cost producer and that's the Onslow development that I referenced earlier in the chat and that that iron ore operation is due to come online uh, by June of 2024 so that's now about six months away from starting production and as we get closer to that date we think the market's going to focus more and more on uh, that side of the business because if iron ore prices hold at current levels that that business should produce between one and a half and two billion dollars worth of EBITDA per annum at spot prices. So it's going to be a very considerable earner for the broader min business. So uh, as we've seen, the pressure on lithium ease somewhat just in the last uh, four or five weeks. And uh, as we get comfortable following our site visit, that 
their iron ore expansion is going according to plan, we've become more constructive on the position uh, again. And so we have been, uh, we've been buying back some of the stock that, um, that we sold. Not all. It's, it's unlikely that we will go north of 10% through, through purchases, but certainly we've been adding at what we think are very attractive levels. And, and uh, you know, we're very constructive on the outlook for that business over the next couple of years. We think it's going to be a very exciting time for Chris Ellison and the team. Yeah, it's quite interesting um, watching the prices play out, but you know, listening and hearing the decision about what do you do when these uh, particular circumstances and the supply chains and the specific uh, price plays out and how do you actually react um, and the decision-making, um, I suppose that's the reason why people look for active managers. But just to paint the picture for people that don't have a chart in front of them, um, uh, lithium carbonate price in what, mid-2021 was about 100000 um, when you referenced, you know, November, December, 2022, it's 600,000 and now it's all the way back down as of today, 97,500. And then with the iron ore price, um, looking at a five year chart, um, wow, it's, it's done something similar. So the iron ore chart, uh, 2020 was practically a hundred cycled all the way up to 230 July, 2021 came all the way back down into the 80s and now we're at 137 uh, US dollar a ton. So, um, yeah, I see what you mean. So if the US uh, iron ore holds the trajectory around about here and all that supply comes on next year, you know, there's still $100 a ton nearly, you know, from the recent peak two years ago, a year and a half ago. Yeah, we don't oh. need to see um, iron ore prices move higher. So uh, Mineral Resources' uh, new um, production at Onslow uh, should have an operating cost of around $40 a tonne. So, uh, yeah, right. $40 a tonne is their uh, operating cost. Yeah. So at 137 there's a lot of margin uh, in that for uh, what should initially be a 35 million tonne per annum um, operation. But we think looking at the infrastructure setup that they have established, has the potential to be considerably uh, larger than that over time. Yeah, very interesting. And good old disclosure, I do own mineral resources personally. You know, I have to always say that <laughs> in case people are listening. Um, so what keeps you up at night and what gets you out of bed in the morning? Well, to be honest, it's, it's, um, it's both the same thing. It's, it's uh, financial markets and it's not keeping me up at night because I'm worried. But I think... If you're investing in the market, um, uh, you know, broadly a managed fund is a good way to go uh, for the simple reason that uh, the, the best investors in the market are typically those that are very passionate about it. I don't have to think about coming to work with um, any sense of dread. I, I love it. I love reading about all of the businesses um, that uh, we own and, and many that we don't own. We love doing um you know, I speak for the whole team. Gav and Will are just as passionate um, about it as I. Uh, no one needs to tell us to do the work because we love doing the work. So it doesn't feel like um, work to us. We love going on site visits. We love drilling into companies. And um, so uh, half the time I'm still reading about things um, as I'm going to bed um, that relate to companies that we're invested in or that we're thinking about. Uh, and when I wake up, I can't wait to get to work because um, it's a passion of mine. It's a passion of Will's. It's a passion of Gav's. It's a real team effort you need to be surrounded by people that um, uh, keep you humble. And uh, we'd like to think that we keep um, each other in check and uh, make sure that we always um, consider uh, every investment proposition carefully. And, you know, in that sense, the team has very good balance in how we um, approach uh, opportunities in terms of, um, you know, uh, having an appropriate level of bullishness where appropriate, but also being um, uh, considerably sceptical uh, about um, uh, uh, many of the things that we, we see and read and hear. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, our view is the passionate team is always going to deliver better returns because um, you end up just spending a lot more time on um, investing activities than than you would if it was just a job. So from our perspective, uh, it's not a job; it's it's a passion. Love it. If anyone wants to learn more about Oscap or yourself, uh, how is it best for them to get in touch? 
Uh, well, you can go more? to our website, which is Auscap, A-U-S-C-A-P-A-M for assetmanagement.com. Uh, or you can reach out to uh, Lauren Murphy, who's Auscap's head of distribution, and she will give you uh, any information that you like. But you can read about um, the team's investment philosophy. We've, we continue to have every newsletter that we have ever published um, present on our website. So you can see what we were saying uh, last month, last year, or 10 years ago. And hopefully you find a consistency in our approach um, and message. Um, a lot of those newsletters have been crafted by different members of the team. So certainly Gav and Will have both written a considerable number of those newsletters. newsletters. I've drafted many of them as well, uh, particularly in the early years. But um, uh, you know, hopefully you won't be able to tell who has written which one, which gives you an indication that we all think about investing in the same way, and we're looking for the same high quality businesses. Uh, we try to be a little bit picky about price. That That is our attitude. And if that resonates, then feel free to um, inquire further. Fantastic. Well, Tim, it's been really good having you on. I really enjoyed this conversation. And um, you got much planned for over the Christmas break. You sticking around? You, you're heading away? We are, we are sticking around uh, over Christmas. Uh, my children are very, very excited about Santa. And, uh, and then we'll head down to the South Coast uh, for a couple of weeks in early January. But um, uh, it's, a, it's an important time uh, to recharge and, and refresh and let's get ready for 2024. Hope it's a good one. Absolutely. All right, Tim, great having you on and uh, have a great day. Thanks, Murdoch. You too. Cheers. Any views expressed in this recording do not represent the view of any other third party and are the sole personal opinions of the speaker. Any reference to financial product does not constitute advice or recommendation and before any action you should seek proper advice from your financial professional. Australian listeners should head to www.moneysmart.gov.au to find more information on obtaining financial advice. To get in touch with York, head to our website www.yorkwealth.com.au.